Welcome to the Profit Cash Growth Podcast. This is the podcast for six and seven figure business owners who are looking to grow a financially successful business. My co-host Claire Hancock is a finance director, chartered accountant and entrepreneur. And every week I'll be exploring guidance and frameworks designed to help you increase your profits, improve your cash flow and grow your business. This week on the podcast, yes, we're still under the weather, but we're here and we find out why a million youngsters are struggling to get into work and we do a deep dive on what business rebates are and how you can use them in your business. Well, Claire, another week, another podcast, and I know we weren't well last week, but I think you've gone downhill, haven't you? Yeah, I have had a whole entire week of a cough, a cold and no voice at all. So my apologies, this is going to be the second podcast where you've got me sounding a little bit rough, but I'm firing all cylinders, I just don't sound it. We've got some great topics to talk about this week, so we just couldn't possibly miss a week. And we'll start with this week's news story. So in the news this week, the story that's caught my eye specifically is how do we get young adults into work? Did you know that we are now at the point where we have 1 million 16 to 24 year olds in this country in the UK here that are neither in full time education nor are they in employment? And that raises a whole ton of questions around how they live their life and how that's even possible. But more importantly, as business owners, if you overlay that into the fact that the majority of business owners I talk to, especially very small business owners, are really struggling to get staff, especially if you're, you know, hair salons, cleaners, that type of thing. Yet we've got a million people who are fit and able. Well, that's half the debate, I guess we'll talk about, but effectively of fit and able age to work. And we just can't get them into employment. What do you think, Claire? What are we going to do about this? Well, When you say that they are fit and able to work, this is a really interesting debate that's not affecting just NEETS, but the general population as a whole, because about 40% of these people that are not in work are citing that they're not in work because of mental health reasons. And I think this is where the the world in particular is becoming incredibly grey because when people are saying I've got mental health problems, that doesn't necessarily mean that they've got a mental health illness, something that has actually been, you know, diagnosed by a professional and requires them to have time off work. And there is this element that's slightly scaring me a little bit is that people are not not learning the skills that they need in life to to be able to cope with everyday life and and you know they're they're citing i've read some statistics today about how many people are nervous about going to an interview at 60 percent of people and it's like well i've never been to a job interview and not been nervous yeah so it's, it's, it's just part of the course how do you prepare yeah. them for that do you think uh, being nervous at a job interview doesn't mean you've got a mental health issue it means you're an absolute human, human being. being and it's what you is it that they're not you know people are not told that these are the emotions that they're expected to feel and that they should feel is is this you know i don't i don't want to blame social media but is it like they see we see the the perfect airbrush life constantly now and we think that it's abnormal now to be nervous or to fail or to have these issues and that's making people stressed i mean they they said that 62 percent of the people surveyed here said that they felt stressed always or often this is before they've even gone into work i mean if the i mean what world are we living in where it's not the work that's causing you the stress or the job that's causing you stress? it's just having nothing to do it's bizarre yeah i mean i can sympathize with that a little bit because i've I'm not somebody that enjoys doing nothing. So if I was sitting at home doing nothing, I could (laughs) easily see how my mental health would deteriorate. But does it deteriorate to the point where I have a mental health problem or is my mental health being caused by the fact that I'm not in the workplace, surrounded by people of different cultures, different backgrounds, different ideas, where I'm not being challenged, I'm not being stimulated? So... But there's so much self, well, there's so much content and education out there now that if they were the right minded, they can certainly consume more than ever at home. I guess the question is, are they grabbing the YouTube channel for the educational channels or are they, you know, Mr. playing Beast. the computer game, watching Mr. Beast and doing whatever? I don't know, because the the information's never been more there and at your fingertips than we are today to be able to get yourself where you need to be and understand what's going on in the world if you listen to the right people and you head in in the right direction it's really difficult because we i mean we follow people like alex hormozy is a great example if you follow alex hormozy on twitter or facebook whatever platform he's on he comes out with some quite what i think direct a quite direct but true statements but a lot of Within other people sphere. look at him and think that he's quite polarizing. He's he's not supporting people. 
and that he's not considering mental health issues and things like that. But there is an element that we are just simply not preparing the youngsters for how tough the world really is. We're wrapping people in cotton wool and telling them that everything will be okay if you just talk about your feelings and everything won't be okay if you talk about your feelings. I think actually the irony is they have lots to be worried and scared about going into the workplace yeah, because do you know what dealing with another human being is pretty damn difficult and we're not particularly nice people sometimes especially when we're on the consumer end of it you know i i run a consumer facing business that's highly emotionally charged and it doesn't take much for somebody to go into their red zone and become somebody that they would hate the look of themselves you know in the way that they are treating the very people that are trying to help them and that is you know that is stressful and that it will give you anxiety for them to worry about but yeah, it look it's a really really difficult one. I think unfortunately the podcast probably isn't long enough for us to debate, debate the it out forever. the the merits of this, but I do think I I cannot urge employers enough to be aware of why younger people may not be applying for their jobs yeah. and think be about creative. how they can accommodate that. Yeah. Because when you do get a good youngster in your business, you know, they come with such energy and such passion and they're not tainted and they haven't been beaten down over the years and all yeah. of those all of those downsides that can come with experience. So having young people in the workplace can be incredibly valuable to to businesses, but it's how can mm. businesses appeal to them? And I think that's the biggest challenge we've got at the moment because there are businesses out there like me and you that unfortunately have got probably a low tolerance for well, some of got, this we've got a customer at the end and that customer doesn't really care about anxiety yeah absolutely we've got to deliver a they good service and get absolutely paid. expect you know, you know your business to deliver so um, that is a difficult line to walk what who's this might be quite controversial but who's who's funding the million people so i mean i'm reading in this article that only two-thirds of the million claim universal credit at £67 a week, so I've funded through benefits. That's 350,000 people that have got no income of adult age. You know, how are they, you know, I wasn't ever in a world where, you know, food needs to go in the mouth, shelter, these things, you know, it's pretty expensive to just get by and live nowadays. So where's that like drive to, or that need, you know, not the want to work, but the need to work is, why is that missing in today's generation? I don't know. Yeah, I guess it's a lot of apathy in general, isn't it, about what's what's the point to life? The world is doomed with climate change and you can't trust any politicians and just generally this negative attitude about the world. And I mean, there was actually a study out this morning saying that youngsters in the UK are some of the unha- uh, one of the unhappiest generations that there's ever been. And it wasn't just the UK, actually, mm. that was a common theme around the world. But one thing I would say is that as a numbers person... When I read these headlines, I always like to go and dig for the truth behind it. Yeah, yeah. And if you actually look at the number of NEETs across the last 30 years... What's a NEET? A NEET, N-W-T, not in education or employment. Oh, they've got a specific... Yeah, name. sorry. <laughs> thought, yes, we we hadn't talking, told anybody about that, so I thought I'd best, I best explain what that means. Are these a bit like, um, not MILFs? <laughs> no, that's something <laughs> no, totally different. completely different. different. Woofties, well off over 50s, that's my favourite saying. Yeah. 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 Anyway, as I say, if you look at the numbers, because the numbers do not lie, actually the number of NEETs is at a very similar level to about 2001 and it has steadily risen since then and then dropped quite dramatically and is going up again. So it does imply that when you look back history, the world has just been on this constant cycle of neeps going through these feelings of apathy and then they come through the other end and we have this big push and we get them all back into employment and back into training and then the numbers climb again. So is this just the world doing its normal cycle? I think that's more what's happening here. Yeah, I I agree. And you can blame, you know, I mean, you can blame negative spins in the media, but the media will always have been like that throughout history. So it's not really that. The world's never been a better place. We've never been more prosperous if you look back through history. I just don't think that message gets out there in a balanced way. So anyway, fascinating one. I don't think we're going to get those million people back to work straight away, but, but we'll see what we can do about it. Anyway, moving on to this week's deep dive topic. So this week, Claire, we're going to talk about business rebates. I watched your YouTube video this week. Fascinating. All about business rebates. Tell us what a business rebate is. And then we're going to have a chat about how businesses could utilize them in their organizations. Yeah, absolutely. So the YouTube video is about putting business rebates in place to encourage your customers to do more spend with you. So 
I was inspired to create this video because I've been supporting a business that has been trying to sign a new exclusivity agreement with a customer. That customer is doing about a quarter of a million turnover with them at the moment and they want to try and double that in the next 12 months. So in order to try and win that business, we put together, we, we called it a partnership agreement and a part of that partnership agreement included a rebate whereby if we hit those certain targets and the customer gave us additional turnover, then they would get certain kickbacks, certain like trigger points. So for example, if they got to 300,000 turnover, they would get like a 5% rebate back. I love these. I used to use these a lot in my previous career with airlines. And it was exactly that. It was a brilliant, brilliant way to stick it to the competition and put something in there that was a real nice sweetener, a ratchet deal or something that said, you know, as we were trading above X amount, then, you you know, you'd get a 10% kickback of everything above a certain amount of spend mm-hmm. with us or various other things. It was brilliant. And why I loved it is because it, you could bake in the fact that you were well into the profitability tar- targets that you would want to hit already. So therefore, anything you were giving back was just a percentage of something above and beyond what you would hope to get if you were running on target for that contract for that client at that time. Yeah, and I think you've touched on a really key point there is the profitability element of it. So it's really crucial that when you're putting these rebate agreements in place with your customers that you want to ideally only pay a rebate on new business because if you pay, say a customer already does £100,000 with you and you say you'll give them a rebate on that £100,000 next year, then essentially you're giving away some of your profit. Yeah, You need to ring fence, always ring fence yeah. existing, existing business, existing profits, otherwise you start to cannibalise your existing sale and you're not really working hand in hand on the new business growth aspect of it. Yeah, absolutely. So that's my number one rule is to make sure that it's a growth based rebate only. There are, of course, occasions where you do need to put a rebate in place to retain customer business. But generally, I'd say you're on a bit of a slippery slope and probably a rebate is maybe a last ditch attempt to keep that customer. And should you just yeah. cut your losses and and sort of move on if, if a rebate agreement is the only reason why a customer staying with you? But generally, with rebate agreements, they can be normally a rebate agreement. Typically, you'd be looking at 12 months. So it does also mean that you've got a period of longevity where you secured that customer. Yeah, the, the, I think you just touched on that. The fear of these type of things is that the customer ends up constantly and, and entirely money driven. And then you worry about why they're making their decision to continue to work with you as the supplier. I mean, you know, any good business would like to know or believe their customers is working with them primarily because they're the right supplier, delivering the right level of service, and they're in it together, not that it's just simply the most financially beneficial thing to do. And it's hard to advise people on that because it depends on on the organization. You know, I had I've had dealings with people like British Airways who are very aggressive and I, I imagine they're pretty similar to suppliers like Tesco who probably would be very much about the money but others perhaps not so much. The conversations that you Simon would have been having with these big blue chip organisations like BA and Tesco's will be very different to the conversations that are happening in small businesses up yeah. and down the UK and it's going to be approached a lot more like a gentleman's agreement so you're going to have a very very basic outline of a, probably a contract that says this is the start date this is the end date and this is the structure for the rebate and it doesn't need to be any more complicated than that it doesn't even have to be a contract it can just be an email confirming what everybody's entitled to, what the terms and conditions are that you want to assign to it. So you don't really need to overcomplicate this. One of the key things that is important when you're thinking about putting this rebate in place is that you want to make sure make sure that you watch the YouTube video because there's lots more information in there about exactly how you do it with some examples. But don't resort to fixed percentages. So what I mean by that is if a, if a customer for example, does not to 100,000 and you want to give them 1%, fine. If they do not to 200,000, they don't automatically get 2% on everything yeah that first Just category the next lap, like stamp duty. yeah absolutely so it should be steps so not to 100 is at one percent 100 to 200 is it is at two percent and the reason why that's really really important is because if you think about the impact on your profitability if that customer just did 101,000 pounds turnover they will get two percent rebate versus if they did 199,000 pound turnover they'll also get two percent so the impact on your net profit percentage can be quite significant so you really need to think about 
making sure that you've got these stepped clauses yep. in your rebate contracts. You know, what business owners really need to do if they're going to go down this route is they need to upskill themselves or they need a financial director to support them through this process, don't they? It is, it's, it's a risk because you can get it very wrong as much as you can get it very right. And you really need to uh, modeled out your profitability and the way that this works and kicks out. And that's exactly what you do with a lot of businesses, isn't it, Claire? Yeah. One of the key numbers that you do need to know is your net profit percentage. So if your net profit percentage is 10%, for example, then that means that for every £100 in turnover that you do, you make £10 profit. So therefore, you need to make sure that any rebate agreement that you're giving, you would never, for example, if you gave away 10%, you're giving away all of your profit. So you need to have some key numbers in mind to be able to have a think about how much of your profit you're willing to give away in order to secure more business and grow and grow. Great. Well, zip over to the YouTube channel, watch that video for a bit more detail on that where Claire, again, can bring it out and visualise it a bit further for you. And we'll uh, move forward to this week's Profit Cash Growth Extra. So just this week, we have seen in the news that HMRC announced that they are essentially cutting down on a lot of the helplines for self-assessment, PAYE and VATs. The VAT helpline, for example, they suggested that could be open for just five days a month for businesses to contact. And, you know, quite frankly, that's absolutely ridiculous. So if you've ever had any dealings with HMRC, you'll know how difficult they are to get hold of and also how difficult it is to get information out of them that actually helps you resolve your query. So my tip is to actually always ask your accountant to deal with this. And it's little known in the business world, but there's actually something called the agent's helpline. So if you are a licensed accountant, then you need to register with HMRC for um, what's known as an agent number. And that agent number essentially gives you a a more direct route into HMRC with more experienced call handlers that are used to more complicated topics. So as a business owner, if you've got an accountant, never, ever, ever contact HMRC yourself. I'd always recommend just asking your accountant to do it because they will have a, a dedicated agent helpline that will enable them to get in touch with HMRC much quicker than you ever could. And they'll be able to resolve your issue much, much quicker too. So it's a not a very sexy one for this week, but the HMRC agent helpline, which is exclusively for accountants, is always by far the most direct route to HMRC. Amazing. It's like the bat phone for accountants. I love it. Yeah, it is. And businesses don't know about it. And unfortunately, with HMRC... That's how accountants do. Well... (laughs) (laughs) Do they? Do they all? Well, if you go with an unlicensed accountant or an accountant that isn't officially acting as your agent, and you know when an accountant isn't acting as your agent because they would, for example, use your login details for like Xero or QuickBooks or something like that. If they've got an accountant profile, then they should also have an agent profile with HMRC. Fantastic. Well, thanks for joining us for another podcast this week. As always, we will be back next week, uh, hopefully fighting fit uh, after the terrible colds that we've, uh, we've had in this last week. And we'll be back focused on helping you lovely business owners to uh, improve your cash flow. Uh, improve your profits and grow your business and as always you can find claire on the youtube channel uh, to the website profitcashgrowth.com or all of the other socials see you guys